I'm going to start by confessing that I am a Vygotskyan. Now, some of you all know what that, what that means in terms of how I'm going to approach things. What, what we Vygotskyans do are interested in learning, interested in culture, interested in mind, and see ideas as tools. Um, and the way we go about doing research quite often is to think about how we're constantly refining ideas, conceptual tools, as we try and make sense of the world. So I'm, that's what I'm going to be talking about. So you're not going to get a, a, a lot of tables and presentations of numbers. What you're going to get is, a, is an account of how I've been working over the last 14, 15 years in refining what I do think now are reasonably um, useful um, conceptual tools for thinking about um, interprofessional collaboration. So that's an sort of advanced organiser, really. Um, what am I going to do? Um, I'm going to talk about the, the challenge of working on complex problems. Most of my work's been <coughs> in the field of um, uh, the prevention of social exclusion and, and child protection, um, and also teacher education, but I'm going to be drawing on the first two rather than teacher education. Um, and those are complex problems. Uh, children's trajectories of vulnerability are always complex. They will involve poverty, mental health, etc., etc. I'm then going to talk about uh, what I've um, pre very pretentiously called the relational turn in expertise. Um, and uh, there I'm, I'm going to bring out these uh, three core ideas, relational expertise, common knowledge and relational agency. And that's going to be at the centre of what I'm going to talk about. I'm not going to talk about working with clients, not because I don't think it's important, I think it's crucially important, but I'm going to be talking about interprofessional work. There is always a danger, and I'll say it now, that we focus too much on the interprofessional work and not enough on, on the relational work with clients. We, 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 as we work interprofessionally, we're probably very likely to increasingly objectify the client. And so I'm saying that, just so you know I recognise it, but I'm not going to be focusing on that this evening. What I want to do, um, if I have time, is to get to the point where we think about um, working relationally both horizontally, that means between different professionals, and also vertically. So how, how do um, senior leaders in organisations work relationally in order to free up and bring together all the expertise and resources that are there in their organisations? And that's crucially important in the welfare professions because it's what happens on the front line that really matters. And, and so I, I hope I have time not to rush through that, but um, if not, I can certainly let you have paper that, that will um, allow me to, to deal with that. Just so that um, you know I'm not making this up, um, that I actually have been out in the field <laughs> and done quite a lot of, lot of analysis. Um, some of the research studies, um, so uh, I, I was the director of the National Evaluation of the Children's Fund, which was fascinating children's fund, some of you will know, was there to kickstart um, interprofessional work way back now, nearly 14 years ago. Um, uh, we've had, I've worked on projects looking at what's <coughs> involved in the learning of interagency working just as professionals were starting to do it and we were sort of following them as they were making sense of their new roles as a four-year uh, TLRP study. Um, we looked at knowledge mobilisation in children's services with the local government association funding that project. They were really interested in how knowledge moves upstream in services. Something I will draw on were two studies of the, direct, of the work of directors of children's services. And then currently, um, um, I've got a project with um, the person who's running our um, Oxfordshire Troubled Families Initiative, um, where the workers working with, with troubled families are uh, doing interprofessional work. Fascinating, a heritage pro project, um, and um, community groups in York, uh, negotiating new pedagogies into a South African university, etc. So these ideas now are sort of interestingly getting picked up and used by a lot of a lot of other people, which is is lovely. Because if you're a Vygotskian, what you what you like is to is to think about how your conceptual tools are being fashioned in use. So if they go, if they're picked up in South Africa or they're picked up in Chile, in different national discourses as well as different workplaces those tools will, will get reshaped and that's what the book is going to be about that was just mentioned. I've got people from all over um, 
involved in writing chapters about how they're reshaping the ideas I'm going to talk with you about. So this is just an example. Um, if I'll answer questions on Galaxy Zoo afterwards because I find that utterly fascinating. Uh, once one of my PhD students. So those are some of the areas where, we, where I've been doing, where I've been doing work and my students have been doing work. Okay, so um, the questions that led to the relational turn in my work Way back, even with the Children's Fund um, work that we did, um, it became very clear that when um, professionals were collaborating, they didn't create new systems. They came together in order to collaborate on particular problems. And sometimes it was important to um, bring in the refugee specialist, sometimes the parental mental health specialist. Um, and, and these systems were fluid, they were creative, they were responsive, there was space in there for the families and the children also to get involved. And so I kept the, the con concepts I had for thinking about what was going on in these spaces had come out of systems theory and it didn't work for me. I mean, maybe there are examples of systems theory that would be more fluid, but I wasn't working with them. And so I began to think about what happens at these intersection of practices, the practice of social work, the practice of teaching, the practice of mental health work. And I'm going to talk more about motives in a moment, but how are motives, these professional motives, aligned so that interprofessional work can be done? Because he did see it happening. You did see people coming in absolutely passionate about putting stuff around the family if they were a social worker, and the teacher being absolutely passionate about the child not missing out on school. But actually, they did manage to align those motives, which could, in fact, be in conflict. So how did they do it? And again, you know, the luxury of thinking, actually, as a Vygotsky, and I can just try and conceptualise what's going on, then test the concepts, um, means that you can follow new work as it arises. And that's what um, I was doing. And that came down to <coughs> this next question, which is what kind of expertise <coughs> is involved in this process? And I, I, I'm an educator. <coughs> I mean, as I said, I'm really interested in teacher education. and I've been working in that field for a very long time. And so I, I, I wanted to be able to put some labels on the expertise that was going on so that it could be brought into training programs. It could be, it could be discussed, it could be tested. Um, and so I w this actually identifying that expertise um, in, in the various research studies became very, very important. Okay, next, <coughs> the next two slides are, are going to be just giving you a bit of the kind of theoretical framing um, that I, I'm, I'm coming from. I call myself a Vygotsky and I'm not going to talk about Vygotsky. I'm going to talk about his great friend and collaborator, Leontev. Um, Leontev uh, worked with Vygotsky in the late 20s in Moscow. Stalin came in. If you were going to be a psychologist in Moscow, um, uh, you had to be uh, immune to poison, actually, because it, it, the um, psychology department in uh, Moscow um, was decimated by Stalin, who saw it as a, you know, a, a hotbed of the bourgeoisie. Um, as, and in fact, um, Vygotsky died of TB um, in 1934, but he would have Everybody is quite convinced he would have gone the way of his, those colleagues of his who stayed in Moscow. Because he was interested, interested in concepts, he was interested in ideas, he was interested in, in what goes on in individuals' minds. Leontev, um, worried about his research group, took them out of Moscow to Kharkov, beyond the Urals, and Vygotsky wasn't well enough to go with them. And what he did was to say, let's, let's have a, a shift. I'm grossly simplifying it, 20 years of fantastic work. But what he did was sort of move away from the focus on the individual concept and the individual mind to look much more at activity. Um, and um, one of the things that he, he's, he, he focused on and has been extra extraordinarily influential is the, is the notion of the object of activity. Or we might want to think about it as the problem space that's being worked on, the task that's being worked on. Um, so 
an example that fits with this evening's talk is, is a child's trajectory of vulnerability because what you want to do is to work on that trajectory with the child and family and help turn it round so that they can, they can connect and be, be included. So it's not an objective, it's, it's what you're focusing on and looking at. Then it gets um, a little bit tricksy and, and um, esoteric because that object of activity will mean different things to different people. So if I'm a social worker looking at that object, the child's trajectory, what, when I look at it, I will be thinking about strengthening the family. I will be thinking about the child in the family and the child in the community. If I'm a mental health worker and I'm looking at adult mental health as well as children's, I will be thinking about the whole family again. If I'm a teacher, I'm going to be worried primarily about attendance um, and the, in the learning environment of that child. So, so the object of activity, some people talk about it being imminent. It contains many meanings. Um, the point that Leontev makes is that actors objectify what matters for them when they look at the task and they look at the object of activity. So the object of, of activity simply by existing calls force um, our interpretations of it, but our interpretations are shaped by the practices we come out of. Now that's really useful because the... Um, object of activity and the object motive that associated with it uh, is, is if you think about that in terms of the complexity of child's vulnerability. So it's very useful to have somebody who is um, thinking about housing, is thinking about mental health, is thinking about the family, um, the community, as well as um, uh, the teacher. Um, it expands the object of activity. You get a much um, stronger sense of the vulnerability and then you can find ways of responding so that you're not simply responding to the bit that you see. And that's what we saw. We saw um, the most successful um, uh, ways of working, most successful ways of working involved expanding the interpretation of the object of activity. I'm going to come on to how they responded because that's where we get to the expertise bit. So, but the important thing is the relationship between the actor and the object of activity is mediated by what matters in the practice. And I use the term what matters because I spent three years in a psychology department and um, I find, I, I think the um, term motive in many ways just leads people off in different directions. So I tend to use the term what matters. Second, the second mm. slide. This is Mariana Hedegaard who is a Danish developmental psychologist working again within the Vygotskian frame that I work with. And she um, has come up with um, a useful framework, which I'll come back to at the end of the session when we look at uh, a research tool that I've developed. But I think it also gives you a sense, if you're not familiar with cultural historical theory, of the different planes of analysis you use if you're a cultural historical Vygotskian theorist. And so um, she argues that we, we, when, we're anal when we're looking at any kind of um, set of phenomena, um, we, it is useful to think about what's, what are the societal, um, I mean social phenomena is what I should say, what kind of societal uh, motives or priorities are in play. So as a researcher that takes you to look at policy documents, etc. For Mariana Hedegaard, the um, institution is where the practices are. Um, so for me, we, uh, my view is that we inhabit practices. And I'll say more about practices. Those practices are shaped by values that are often historic and motives that are a mixture of historic and future. But they will also, some may or may not reflect national priorities or societal priorities. The interesting area is, is the question of the activity setting, the place where these activities uh, occur. So where we might meet as a group in order to talk about a managed move for a child, for example. Um, and in each activity there will be a number of, each activity setting there will be a number of activities. And those activities will be motivated. 
and, those, and we can't, as researchers, assume we know what those motives are. So exploring those motives become very interesting. And then we can get down and say, well, what's the person actually doing in that activity? Um, and what are their purposes and motives in, in, in what they're doing? And this owes a lot to uh, Leontiev on motive. It also owes a lot to Vygotsky, because Vygotsky's big, big contribution to us was to say, as to say in order to understand um, how people are understanding, how p other people are understanding the world, we need to look at what they do. We need to look at what tools they use and how they use them. And so that's not simply inferring from observation. Language is a tool. Um, so if I ask my five-year-old grandson to tell me how many seats there are in the front row, if Max goes two, four, six, ooh, six, six, I know that he can't, you know, he's just learnt it by rote. Um, so it, these kinds of um, focuses on the activity is absolutely at the core of what we're doing and how people use tools. So that's the theoretical, kind of theoretical framing. And now I'm going to talk you through these, um, these ideas um, uh, in, 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 in slightly more slowly. Okay, shameless book plug. I'm, um, it's number two, actually, isn't it now? <laughs> um, so th this, th this came out in 2010. It's got a really clumsy title, Being an Expert Professional Practitioner, because it's in a book series. I wanted it to be called The, Exp the, um, the uh, Relational Turn in Expertise. But in it, the reason I, I've, I've got it here is because I like this definition of practices, because I wrote it myself and I feel comfortable <laughs> with it. Um, but I think it's important in terms of, now you can see the, where I'm coming from in terms of Leontiev and Vygotsky. And it fits in very well with a lot of the work on practice theory that a lot of you will be familiar with, in org from organisational theory. Um, practices are historically accumulated, knowledge-laden, emotionally freighted, and given direction by what is valued by those who inhabit them. So we've got that notion of practice. It's a really strong notion of a practice. There's a lot of baggage in that practice, as well as a lot of fruitful knowledge. Um, so that w with that definition of practice, we cannot really mm. underestimate how difficult it is to collaborate on a complex problem like a child's trajectory. Now, this kind of work that um, I'm talking about um, is not unusual. The, 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 the growth of interprofessional working in welfare uh, professions is um, you know, not unique to the welfare professions. And here's Jeff Mulgan, who I, um, whose work I, I like a lot, but I'm only going to half agree with him here. He's, he's talking about a policy shift to networks and projects and away from traditional structures. And then he goes on to say, horizontal structures are essential to complement vertical ones. And I want to say, no, 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 no. I don't agree with the second part of that. Because what you get, if you set up horizontal structures, then what you will get, end up with, are um, fossilised, non-responsive ways of working on complex problems that are going to be changing all the time. So I, I will use the term architecture. I think I can somehow sort of live with the notion of architecture in the sense that one can wander around and make different connections in it. But the notion of structure seems very strong to me. Um, so networks and projects and knowledge exchange and um, fluidity and mobility and finding ways of exchanging ideas, absolutely, but not structures. And I much prefer this notion that's come from two, two Norwegian researchers. And they say, horizontal working uh, needs cooperative effort and cannot easily be imposed from the top down. And all the work we've done with children's services just completely confirms that. Um, and the <coughs> role of a successful reform agent is to operate more as a gardener um, than as an engineer or an architect. And, and OK, so I'm using architects slightly more loosely than they are. But 
that course, I mean, I'm a Vygotskian, I like this notion of ideas as tools, this is a gift of a metaphor for me. So um, what I'm going to do is to talk you through some of the gardening tools that, that um, we've developed. So, or I've developed, the first one is relational um, expertise. And this I see as a kind of overarching concept uh, where the, others, the other two will sort of play into that. Um, we had come to see, particularly with, with the Children's Fund project, which was you know, right across England, that um, knowing who, or more importantly, knowing how to know who might help you, might add a, bring another resource in to deal with this complexity, help you interpret the complexity, was a very important attribute for interprofessional working. Um, in addition to knowing what, why, how and so on. And um, I just love Google Scholar. I'm sure I'm not the only one in the room. <laughs> Terribly dependent. Uh, so I thought, I went, oh, somebody else will have thought about this, won't they? So I, go, I put it into Google Scholar and up came um, a Danish researcher called Lundeval, who does a lot of work for the World Bank um, in Africa. Um, and it broadly works in the field of development economics. And, and he had come up with this notion way before you know, we started thinking about it, of um, knowing who be as being really important when you are working in, um, in, in Africa in, um, with cases where poverty is extreme. You've got to find a way of being able to recognise and muster the resources that are there in order to develop sustainable um, uh, improvement. Um, and so relational expertise involves knowing how to know who. Um, and I'll just leave that there. But uh, alongside actually being able to recognise who might be able to help, both diagnose and respond, um, it is, is a, a capacity for recognising the standpoints and the motives of others. Um, we worked with a um, director of children's services who was absolutely outstanding, a, a woman, um, and from the South East, who would say, I want to find out the grit in her shoe. And I thought it was a really nice way of actually saying this sort of, what is it that makes her want to keep on doing this extraordinarily difficult job? Um, so recognise the standpoints and motives of others who inhabit other practices. And then finding ways of mutually aligning those motives. So relational expertise is something then that you can do as a social worker when you're working with a teacher. Listening to what she's saying, understanding why she's banging on about uh, um, uh, uh, attendance when actually you think it's much more important to strengthen the family. Um, but finding ways of aligning those motives. And I'll talk about common knowledge and relational agency as, as part of that. So relational expertise is an additional form of expertise and it augments specialist expertise to make these fluid responsive collaborations important. Um, possible. It is absolutely not a substitute and another talk would be why it's not a substitute because it's actually really dangerous if it is just a substitute. I know who but actually I haven't got any kind of specialist expertise. So it's not about um, creating some kind of hybrid all per purpose worker. It's, much, it's actually the opposite as we'll see. It's much more about making very clear what your specialist expertise is and then also being very adept at, at recognising the expertise of others. So, here's a practitioner in the Children's Fund study saying um, something. So, I, 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 you know, I could have said all of this and could have gone home 20 minutes earlier because she's saying it. It's only a matter of adjusting what you do to other people's strengths and needs. But it's slightly more than that, I think. Here is um, Helga Nwatney, um, who, as most of you will know, is a very, very um, experienced and highly regarded sociologist in Europe. And she was also um, wrote the New Production of Knowledge with Peter Scott, who was here not so long ago, and, and a number of other people. 
And she's become really concerned about the way knowledge seeps out of systems and becomes sort of information, really, and people think they know things when they don't. Um, and she writes, she's been writing quite a bit about that. Um, but she's really echoing what I just said, that knowing how to know who, know who is not a substitute for your own expertise as a social worker or a teacher, whatever. And in one of her papers, she talks about um, what we need to do now as specialists, as experts, is to build links and try and integrate what we know with what others want or should know and do. And so what she's saying is, is we can't really just allow for um, a free flow of knowledge. We need to think about how we create those links and what kind of expertise is involved, involved in those links. So I, I think really that, that quote's there almost only to say what I'm talking about is part of a general zeitgeist. A number of people are really being concerned about it, not only within the welfare professions. Okay, gardening tool number two. Um, the notion of common knowledge. This term common knowledge has been around uh, for a while and is used in different ways. So I'm just going to take one strand through that. David Middleton um, wrote, has written about um, common knowledge in medical teams. And these are teams. Um, but it's the kind of common knowledge where, where you see a set of presenting problems and you, and you might say, Mrs. Bloggs last week, in the sense of, you know, this is probably quite like what we saw, but you don't go into all the different um, aspects of what's there. But it'd be a quick way of getting in, and if you're in the team, you will, you will know. So that common knowledge is, is a shorthand, um, <laughs> and we, you can think of any examples. You will have them in your own families, with your own friends. Um, uh, they, they'll be two words and they'll mean everything. Um, I'm not... It, what I'm taking from Dave Middleton's work is that it is a shorthand. But I'm, I'm not looking at teams. I've not been looking at teams. I've been looking at people who come from these sites of intersecting practices with their different practice histories to work on these complex problems. And that's a real challenge. And so I... I started to think about um, common knowledge much more in terms of being made up of or consisting of the motives, the what matters for the other. So if I'm a teacher and I'm obsessed with school attendance and you're a social worker and you are really worried about strengthening the family, I know that strengthening the family is what matters for you. And so as a teacher, when I he hear you say strengthen the family, I, I recognise that that motive is an important one for you. And you recognise attendance is an important one for me. And so that, those, two, those two sets of motives become common knowledge. And then that common knowledge mediates how we will collaborate. So I, as, as an attendance-obsessed teacher, I will stand back and let you as a social worker do some family strengthening and then you as a social worker know that I do want to know as soon as possible about putting in some kind of return to school um, system for, for the child. So, um, so for me, common knowledge was, 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 is made up of these motives. And again, Google Scholar to the rescue. Um, I put in um, common knowledge and a things came up, some of you from teacher education and teaching will know the um, Neil Mercer book with Derek Edwards, Common Knowledge, but it's a different way of, of thinking about it. And here's Paul Carlyle, and I would never have come to this. Um, Paul Carlyle um, did a, a lovely, lovely three-year ethnography of the semiconductor industry in California. And uh, he uses the term common knowledge, and he uses the term common knowledge in a very, very similar way to the way I've just been describing it, in terms of made up of what matters. Um, and it's, uh, it's really important um, in terms of knowledge mobilization in an innovative company like, um, in, in industry, like the semiconductor industry. 
Uh, because what you have is lots of separate units doing their own research, finding things out. But the danger there is that um, they, 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 they're working in, in parallel and not connecting. So what you need is a, is, is a way of understanding how knowledge moves between these different units. And he's, he found that they were paying attention to this. Um, and um, his notion of um, common knowledge, his desc he, d he described the, the way in which they did this as, um, as, 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 as building common knowledge. What he said was that if you want knowledge to move between systems, between these units, um, you need to think about whether you're going to get transfer, translation or, or transformation. I'll give you an, a, an example. So if I were to say to, to Lynette, media, uh, and in a Vygotskian sense, I'm, I actually don't know whether it would work, but I'm assuming. Um, if I talked about mediation in a Vygotskian sense, um, uh, and um, I think it would just be transfer. We'd know what each other meant. I had a conversation uh, a few months back with one of my colleagues, Chris, who's an English specialist, who was looking at my student's work. She was going for upgrade and PhD. And he said... She's used mediation in a really strange way. And I said, oh, well, Chris, this is what it means in the Gotskian terms. Oh, fine, OK. You know, it took me 15 seconds, 20 seconds. There was translation, because he you know, was close enough. If I use the term mediation over the supper table with my daughters and my sons-in-law, they think I'm talking about Syria or Middle East. And, and because it's a complete, it, it, there's trans transformation would need to be done and it's, life is too short to do it. It's just not worth it. I wouldn't even try. Um, but if we can get to the point where you can have just quick translation, and maybe at best transfer. So if I know when you're talking about, you know, you're a, you're a social worker talking about assessment, and I'm a teacher talking about assessment, we both know we mean different things. Um, and um, so well, what's interesting about common knowledge, here again, Carlisle, bringing up this sort of emotional aspect of it, the what matters. He talks about the capacity of common knowledge to represent the differences and dependencies now of consequence. So this is semiconductor industry, and it's about recognising what matters, the dependencies that are currently of consequence. So there's a real challenge then in terms of how we build that common knowledge, because as we certainly saw it, one of our... Um, for example, one, uh, one of our educational psychologists saying, um, I have learnt to speak the language of clinical psychology, so now I can get my kids looked at straight away. So this, this kind of thing. So how does it build? Um, uh, it's built in talks at sight of intersecting practices. And one of the many, many, many tragedies of the last four years has been that there's been less time for meetings. People, ha you know, people are not meeting. Um, they're being cut. They cost too much in terms of time and travel, etc. But that's a loss because actually these face-to-face -face meetings are really quite crucial. In, in those meetings, I th I'm going to be arguing those meetings need to be just slightly structured in some way. There's some kind of uh, overarching architecture about them. It's important. It seems to be the important to have important to have long-term open goals um, such as high quality education for all. This is the South African one that everybody seems happy to work with. You know, it's the motherhood and apple pie, children's well-being. Who can not agree that that's important? And then you sort of work back from that to um, think about, well, how, do, how am I contributing to that? And the social worker recognising the teacher actually is. Um, um, and then there's this question about, well, you can... If you're acute and ac an acute listener, you can reveal your values and motives in talk. Um, and so that can happen. And certainly it's really helpful to be in on the discussions that other, other um, practitioners are using. But I'm going to argue that actually there needs to be a little bit more work on that. So there's a more attention in these um, meetings needs to be paid than simply sitting around talking to each other, to recognising and engaging with the values and the motives of others. Um, and 
Jan, Jan Derry um, is a philosopher at the Institute of Education, again, working in Vygotsky and Field. And what she's done is um, look at the work of uh, philosophers Sellers, um, Brandom, uh, McDowell, and uh, the work that they've done over decades now on um, creating what they call a space of reasons. And in that space of reasons, it's legitimate to ask for and give reasons. And she connects that work with um, the work of somebody called Joe Dunn, who's done a lot of work on experience. And he, what Joe Dunn argues is that um, we need to find ways of bringing to the surface the knowledge that's held in the rough ground of experience to make it open and visible for discussion. Um, and I've, Jan's a friend of mine, and we've had long, long discussions about this, but it, and it does seem to be the case that uh, common, the common knowledge is created um, when <coughs> there are opportunities for asking why, uh, and to have that why <coughs> being non-hierarchical, so it's not about counting for yourself. You know, if I'm a senior educational psychologist and you're a family worker, you can ask me why, rather than me saying, and why, um, to you. So it's, it, 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 has to, it has to be managed, and there's something about you know, the appropriate kind of leadership to, to ensure that that happens. But this notion of the uh, space of reasons, I think, is really very, very important in terms of common knowledge. So the third, third gardening tool um, I want to talk about is relational agency. And this is where I started. I started with relational agency. Um, I was working, doing a, 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 it's a round tree funded project and on l learning in informal settings actually and I was sort of being a kind of ethnographer which mainly meant sitting around in a, a women's drop-in centre in central Birmingham where women with mild mental health problems came and they had mild mental health problems because they were poor, I mean they, that, it was poverty. But what, what we saw there, what I saw there, was the way in which the workers were um, working alongside the, the women to help them unpack the problems they were facing, whether it was not being able to pay their electricity bill or not knowing how to deal with teachers in school, and then working, and then working alongside them as they, as they responded. I began to see that there was a kind of relational form of agency. These women were much better able to work in, in, in fellowship, really, with, with others. And then we also saw through our interviews mm. and life history accounts that they, they were doing it with each other too. So that was where I started. Um, and so what's, what's by relational agency, I mean working together on a complex problem in the heat of action. So this is when you bring in to play your um, relational expertise and you bring into play the common knowledge. So it involves aligning your own responses to the enhanced interpretation. So you know, aligning your own responses to the interpretation of the child's trajectory, for example. And then, um, sorry, aligning, sorry, sorry it involves aligning your interpretations and then aligning your responses. And the aligning of the responses is, is really quite complex. So, here we have an example of the limitations of my capacity with PowerPoint above anything else. But there's a child's trajectory. Um, and here we will have a social worker. And when she looks at that child's trajectory, she's seeing it in, in terms, she's bringing to bear what matters. Her view of it is mediating, is mediated by care, family, what interventions are available locally, etc. When the teacher looks at the child's trajectory, she's uh, look, thinking about it in terms of uh, um, attendance, curriculum, attainment. Um, and then they will expand, all this, all I've, I've said before. And, but what enables them to do that expansion is the common knowledge, this joint understanding of what matters for each other so they can calibrate how they go about doing that response. Um, and so they, what they are doing is aligning their responses through employing 
common knowledge as a way of understanding what they're doing. Um, so this made <coughs> huge sense to me in terms of what we were seeing in all these projects um, as with, with welfare professionals. And this time last year, actually, I, I was at an event, the Finnish Institute of Occupational Health, and they had a day and a half on, on common knowledge. And this, these are some of the projects where they were using the ideas, and you think, this is so interesting. Um, prisoners' trajectories, different professionals working on, on the trajectories of prisoners. Um, fluency in the traffic system in Helsinki. Well, Helsinki isn't a bad place to drive around, so <laughs> maybe. <laughs> um, but they were using it to, 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 to un uh, un understand what was going on, how buses can talk to people obsessed by buses can talk to people obsessed by trains. Um, common assessments, I think that's a pretty, uh, pretty obvious one, and we can see that in the UK too. Allender, annual calendar of supervisors' work, and so on. But I think it's just fascinating that the one that they were just putting together a project on was um, the supply chain in the forestry in industry. So they were thinking about how they actually managed to align uh, what they're working on there. So I'm saying it's, it's quite flexible. Um, so practices are shaped and taken forward by motives, and these motives shape how we interpret <coughs> problems. Common knowledge is made up of what matters for each practice, and common knowledge mediates collaborations in these sites of intersecting practices. That's really, really, really what I'm arguing. So um, that's the horizontal work. So in the, in the last sort of um, maybe eight minutes, if I can squeeze eight minutes, um, then um, I want to just think about it in terms of the vertical. Um, and you'll all, all be familiar with this, it's Eileen Munro <coughs> uh, report. And um, she is, says in that something I think is you know, extremely important when thinking about the work of people like directors of children's services, where they've got to bring together these horizontally linked or not linked organisations and somehow sort of pull them all together. Um, and she, uh, she says, leaders need to be able to know their organisations well and constantly identify what needs to be realigned in order to improve performance and manage change. And I think she's saying much more you know, than the stand in the balcony and see what's happening kind of notion of leadership. She really is talking about the need to keep on aligning and realigning um, in these very, very, very complex organisations that she's been looking at. So here, it, this kind of um, challenge that she set up is one that has been vexing um, people I interested in practice and strategy, or, uh, and strategy as practice, but also the linking between strategy and practice in organisations. And here's Harina Vosukas saying, we've got to, we, as, as researchers, we've got to get better at, at actually seeing what people do deliberatively and non-deliberatively in actions, I'm adding to his, to his what he's saying, but I'm sure he'd agree with me because he's, he's a cultural histori historical sympathiser. Um, but we, we need to be thinking about um, what's happening in actions, in activities, and how does that relate to strategy. That's how I'm choosing to interpret him. Um, and that takes us into this whole question of the use of relational expertise in leadership. Here is somebody who is absolutely a cultural historical person, Yuri Engström. And uh, Engström always looks at everything from a systemic um, standpoint. But he, again, he's saying, I'm quoting him, I, I could be quoting work that we've, we've written, which is, we, when resources are thin, We've got to think about how we muster, how we recognise, how we bring together all the resources that are available within an organisation in order to work on what matters for the organisation. So I'm moving on then to just briefly look at the, the st some two studies, or one study, of directors of children's services. I'm going to just cut to the chase and go to the second study, where, where we focused on leadership for learning. Um, we looked at 10 highly successful DCS. We looked at what they did, 
we looked at how they take forward they, their strange, their, their strange, their change strategies. And I've written it up with Mark Thompson um, about in terms of how did they create an organisational narrative where the organisational narrative was a weaving together of these motives um, that um, um, wove people together. So there's the report. Um, in this stage of the study that I'm going to talk about, they completed two templates about their actions in activities in practices for six weeks. And then they were interviewed based on these templates. Um, and um, what was interesting, I'll show you the templates in a moment. These, these were very powerful reflective tools for these um, directors of children's services. Um, they um, never happened to me before. We got, we got back um, two templates every week from everybody, which has never happened to me before in, in terms of getting data when you've asked for it from busy people. And they, some of them get sent back many more. So this is the template. Um, and we asked them um, very briefly to describe one everyday activity where they were aware they were promoting learning. So it could be an ordinary activity, chairing a meeting, working with colleagues. What did you do? Remember the, the head of goal framing? What did you do in that activity? And what were your long-term strategic aims? So that's, that's all we asked. And then we used the 12 or so that we got back for each person as the basis of, a, of an interview. But these are the kind of things that, that came up and they, so attending an overview and scrutiny committee. They model skills, listening to questions, simplifying answers to ensure that councillors and members of the public understand, presented reports which set out options. And what they were trying to do was to help colleagues understand the political agenda, to be able to work well with the elected <coughs> councillors, drive forward strategic strategies, blah, blah, blah. So their whole, they, they knew exactly what they were doing. But what they were doing was highly, highly relational. They were identifying with their colleagues what needed to be worked on um, and then they were sometimes modelling, sometimes sharing the activities with them, um, sometimes actually simply walking out. When, um, there's a nice example of somebody who was a brilliant DCS said, actually this time I just left the room and let them work it out for themselves rather than having a kind of dependency relationship. But what was very clear from all of these data and from our interviews that these guys, men and women, were working very relationally to find out the motives mm. of the other people that they were working with and to weave those m motives into an organisational nar narrative that they could mm. then use <coughs> as a lever to take forward change. And of course, they were tough guys as well. And if, those if, if people didn't buy into that narrative, um, and, or, and then they, they didn't last very long uh, either. So th it, wasn't, it wasn't all cosy. But that's, that's what we, we um, were finding using that kind of um, way of going about um, looking at their the actual actions in activities as they were taking forward strategy. Okay, so my final, final slide. Um, I've drawn here on a feminist philosopher called Sayla Ben-Habib, who has a sort of notion of discursive rationality that she's written about quite a lot. And here she's saying, um, what I propose is a moral conversation in which the capacity to reverse perspectives, that is the willingness to reason, so we're back to Jan Derry on reasoning again, uh, the willingness to reason from the other's point of view and the sensitivity to hear their voice is paramount. That I think that that's at the nub of my argument in terms of both horizontal and vertical um, relational expertise. Um, so the takeaways really I, is that, I, that relational expertise is in addition to one's core expertise. And th another talk would be about this in terms of professionalism, you know, the Evitt's notion of occupational professionalism rather than organisational professionalism plays into this. It allows the expertise or resources offered by others 
up and down the organisation and across to be surfaced and used. It's relevant to horizontal and vertical. It respects history, and I think that's so important. I mean, we could be talking more and more about identity here as well. But it respects history, but it is focused on going forward. So those are the, those are the, four, the four takeaways. And I'll, I'll stop. Um, five or ten minutes for, for questions, and there is those food outside as well. I would be told you never keep people sandwiches, especially at <laughs> the hill. We've got five or ten minutes, and I will be around. Yeah. Yeah. Um, thank you. Very interesting, and um, very well put some of my experience as I'm nurse by background. All right. Very um, pertinent in respect yeah, to yeah, my yeah. relationships with, um, with <coughs> practitioners. Mm. Uh, just, I wanted to, to ask the question. You use the example of the teacher and the social worker. So there was, there was only the two yeah. kind of experiences there. What about when it becomes more than two? Yeah. Or where you involve people who have not got a professional background, such as families, yeah. carers, yeah. the individual themselves. Yeah. yeah certainly yeah. for, for um, adolescents and certainly for adults. Yeah. Absolutely. Um, I'm, I'm just because of, you know, 40 minutes, which to, I've stretched a 50 minute talk. Um, it, I, I just gave two. I mean, it, it could be it could be any number, really. I mean, it obviously, it would get difficult if it were too large. Um, but some some of the, the problems that are being faced will you know, bring together six different professions without any trouble, without any trouble at all. Um, I, I think uh, I absolutely agree with you about you know, remembering the role that the client has has in this. Uh, there's, w when you read the, the, the sort of um, Engstromian stuff and, and on, on activity theory and objects of activity, he, 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 he sort of wags his finger and says, you have to remember that the object will always bite back. And I think, well, actually, when you're dealing with an adolescent, yes, of course they will, and so they should. Um, and in that diagram, my inept diagram, yeah, I mean, it's two-way arrow. Uh, as well, so you would, you know, you would be expecting um, the um, practitioners to be learning a huge amount. A lot of the tools we have to do that aren't particularly good. Um, I've been working with a social worker um, just outside Oxford who has been, uh, uh, she's doing preventative work, and ha whether we can, well, we have um, simplify aspects of the common assessment framework so that um, parents or carers can work at home on a more accessible version of it and then come into the meetings with something they prepared earlier. So I think there's, there's a lot to be done on that. We ha really have, I think, gone down the track of objectifying the family far too much. Yeah. Oh. <laughs> uh, I'm a student here at Edgehill, um, nursing, child nursing again by background and on an early years teacher's course here. Okay. Um, I just wanted to know, as professionals and based on your professional opinion and or your research, is there anything we could be doing more as practitioners to influence child protection? Like, is there still more of a way to go that doesn't go outside our professional boundaries? I mean, I mean in terms of, of professional uh, collaboration, I think it varies from local authority to local authority as well. Isn't it? Um, I, I think we should just never, ever give up uh, recognising um, the expertise of, of others. But I mean, I find this so hard to talk about year by year now since <sighs> May 2010. Mm -hmm. You know, it's just, life is just so extraordinarily difficult for people who are dealing with child protection. Um, so yeah, I can say there are things, lots of things we should be doing. Yeah, mm. yeah, yeah, yeah. This one. Oops. Um, that was absolutely fascinating. Um, um, and um, for me, one of the things that, um, in relation to some of the research that I've done in, in terms of just working with people and trying to work from the bottom up, is um, trying to get, in terms of trying to get that moral conversation, there has to be a respect. 
Yeah. There has to be that openness. And have you found that the hardest thing to get is that willingness to be open in the first place, that willingness to see different perspectives, but also when people, um, or <coughs> as part of that process, if, if and the openness and that convergence of meaning, do you get ever get a sense that people think they've understood somebody, but because oh, yes. of that background that yes. obviously influences how you see, you think you've understood, but what you think you've understood in terms of that convergence, yeah. that conversation, yeah. that dialogue, is informed by your experience rather than that otherness, that other perspective and that shared, yeah. that common knowledge. It's, it's your common knowledge. Oh yeah, I think, yeah, no, I mean, two, two things. Uh, wh one is I've become more and more interested in leadership since I've been doing this work and see the importance of leadership. So getting the right kinds of accountability systems in, in place so that people don't feel they have to sort of stay in their silos for safety. Um, and that's why I mean, that, that notion of relational agency is so important because it actually does strengthen quite low status professionals actually in terms of working together so you do find that that, that will want to happen um, the, the question of sort of misunderstanding um, this is why I actually do think you do need to have some and it comes back to leadership again some kind of orchestration where it is appropriate to be asking asking for reasons and to have that and certainly what we've been doing with the troubled families or thriving families as they're now called initiative um, is, 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 is developing CPD sessions where, where that happens um, um, it's been utterly fascinating for the, the really low status badly paid family workers who are working in, in those areas um, actually recognizing how much expertise they've got because there is that asking for reasons that comes out and using the template as a sort of prompt for that. You mentioned about meetings and about how it's, it's um, perhaps disappointing that meetings are getting fewer because yeah. of um, demands. Yeah. The um, innovative ways of holding meetings, so the, the telephone conferences, the yeah. email, yeah. Can you ever um, replicate yeah. That's a good question. in yeah. different alternative ways rather than yeah. sitting around in a I room? Ha I haven't, but uh, the opening um, s slide with the, the, the title on actually had a Skype um, sign up, and that's because um, the f one of the projects being run out of the Finnish Institute of Occupational Health have been doing that. Um, they, the, 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 the people who are involved did meet face to face. I think they're involved in the oil industry, if I remember correctly. And, um, and then ha having had the face to face meeting, they then went all around the world. Uh, and, they, and, and they're using the common knowledge concepts in order to analyse that work. So I, th I think so. Um, but it's not, it seemed to be from what they were saying to me, having the face to face meeting so that, that, that was, was a, st a, you know, the, a necessary jumping off point. But I don't know. We'll wait to see what comes of it. Um, how do you avoid or how do you manage conflict in this process of discovery? I, I'm shorthanding it for my own understanding. How do you avoid conflict in, yeah, in the yeah. building of common knowledge, do you yeah. mean? Um, you don't. what happens when conflict actually occurs? Yeah, you, do, you don't actually, you don't avoid it. Um, I mean, it, I, I haven't, because I have been looking at people who are making it work, I guess. Um, so I've never got to the point where we've seen anything that has just completely gone into meltdown and not continued. Um, but the in play, uh, we have come across, because we've been, been taping meetings, we have come across conflict, and that's actually been extremely useful. Because what it does is, you know, the, 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 there's, you know I've been avoiding talking about emotion, certainly because that's another way of talking about what I'm doing, but that the, the surfacing some of the emotional attachment that's involved in being a, a, a committed professional um, is also very important. So there will be times when um, there are very strong differences of opinion, 
Um, and that again takes us back to leadership, of course. Mm -hmm. but, it's, but if you're doing, one, one of the, the theoretical <coughs> tools in this field is it's been developed by Uriel Engström, and where you actually <coughs> look for conflict and use that conflict as a way of um, expanding your understanding of what it is that you're about, whether you've got the right kind of tools, if you've got the wrong kind of rules in place. So actually, you know, you get very excited when you see conflict because it becomes a sort of opportunity for quite interesting both analysis but also intervention if you're doing that kind of research. Um, so it, it's not shying away, it's, it's not, it's not cosy. Thank you. Thank you.